Hello, my name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the Executive Editor for Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's webinar, Helping HR to Cross the Big Day Chasm. As a, just a couple of points to get us started, due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Let me introduce our, our speaker for today, Mario Faria. Mario is the Big Data Advisor at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and member of the MIT Data Science Initiative. He was first Chief Data Officer for Latin America. He worked as a CDO for Boa Vista, a credit bureau services provider in Brazil, which is partly owned by Equifax. Although he is a professor of marketing and strategy at the MBA program of the Laureate uh, University and a contributor of several conferences, magazines, and publications in the area of, of big, data, big data analytics, data management, digital marketing, social media, and technology. Prior to Boa Vista, Mario has worked for IBM, Accenture, and Microsoft, leading projects related to BI, DRM, supply chain, development, and management consulting. Mario has an MBA from the University of California at Santa Cruz, MSc from the University of New York at, Al at Albany, and a BSc from Unicamp, Brazil. Mario has moved to the U.S. in January 2013 and is currently working as a big data business advisor, helping, com helping companies to cross the data chasm. We're very lucky to have him here today, and with that, I will give the floor to Mario to begin the presentation. Mario, well, welcome. I appreciate the kind introduction. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining in. Uh, the purpose of this uh, web is to help HR professionals understand what is happening as the world is up to date on data and technology, and give them some insights, and also to the hiring managers how can build a successful data analytics organization. Okay. I know that uh, your work, work is not easy, and my goal here is to give some insights and some materials and some points from my uh, experience that I have been uh, passing through at this point, and also with discussions that I am having with other chief data authors on this matter. Okay. I have a personal mission, it is to help the data community worldwide to evolve with sustainability. In the sense that I do share my knowledge, I try to present as much as I can in conferences, write, write papers. I just came back from Europe in a series of presentations there on the issue of big data. And it's very important for people like me who is like a step uh, 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 in front of everyone to share technology because of that we will grow this area with quality, with a very pro professional approach, and we will make at the end of the day the technology world, the data world, a, a better place to work and to live. Okay, why I've chosen this name for my presentation, like helping HR to cross the big data chasm. There was an author that on the 90s he wrote a book. It's called Crossing the Chasm, and his name is Je Jeffrey Moore. And for me, at that time, when I started working on the technology world, that was one of the best books that I read, and it guided me uh, throughout every decision that I have taken so far. And for uh, Jeffrey Moore, here on the slide, the adoption curve of technology, technology what is adopting uh, by uh, um, the community and the society in general, it's through several steps, like have like people willing to pay a high premium to get access, er, which are the innovators, and then those innovators influence some early adopters and visionaries, and have the chasm. And at that point, you've seen technologies that will be able to cross the chasm, chasm, and some technologies that are not able to do that. And big data, we have crossed that. Big data of today has reached a mainstream where we see real, real cases and applications. And my goal is we have to help 
HR and higher measures, help them to cross the chasm here on how they should attract, retain, hire, and uh, sustain their data organizations. Okay, so that's the first reason why I have chosen this uh, title. And let me tell you the truth: the people, the analytics people, and the professionals are not making your life easier. To talk in very technical terms, they try to make the things harder as uh, they are. And my goal here is to make the things simpler in a sense that we will have a better understanding for you to do your work and at the same time present some questions that you are able to challenge uh, the data analytics professionals. Okay? So if you go into the granular details, yeah, of course it is complicated, but it's the very important for everyone to bring the conversation on a certain level that everyone can be involved and understand what is needed, what is required to uh, the, the, those professionals. Okay, so if a HR person wants to learn more about uh, well, how can I hire big data professionals, what do I do? First thing, when you know anything, you go to Google. So I typed there, hiring big data professionals yesterday. And guess what? I found more than 51 million results. There is no way that a normal individual can learn anything by looking at uh, this huge amount of information. Here we have a big data problem. Okay, so the information that is presented to us is presented in a way that it's very hard for anyone to digest a no subject. So I decided to go to the other uh, web uh, search engine, which is Bing. So I typed there to say word hiring. Big data professionals. Guess what? Almost two million results. There's no that you can do with uh, anything with two million results. So when you try to find something uh, that you don't know too much, and then you go to Google, go to Big, and you cannot find the right answer, what you do? Hey, you have a consultant to to help you make uh, sense on that. And I'm a consultant. I have uh, uh, been a consultant for my whole time. And even though when I wasn't uh, a consultant working for a company as a chief data officer, I always see myself as a consultant. And when you're a consultant, you're bringing to solve problems to make uh, a business have a better sense. And maybe a consultant, I would like to, to say three things to you. First, where the market is at this point. Second, what's the completion? Why? Are we struggling with big data and uh, uh, big data professionals? And third, what I recommend as a solution, or what you should do, how you should do it, and uh, the steps that you have to uh, take to be successful. So let me go to the current situation. How we got here in terms of big data, and with here because the uh, web has been created in the middle 90s has uh, allowed us to use a lot of information that we passed from the bricks and clicks on the first websites and they start going to a, a craziness of social media. Web, the web has now become very data driven so that when you do a search uh, on, on Google, see some things and, and your click, if he or she does the same search, it will appear completely different results for the other person. Why? Because more and more the web is being driven by behavior, by preferences, by your profile, by your previous access to information. And more, and more we're going to be seeing things like machine learning, predict analytics, um, automated modeling, where it will make the web and what we call web 3.0, the next phase of the internet, which is very, very data driven. That's why the explosion of information happened. And to tell you the truth, there are four things and four driving factors that I've seen in the world today that are not, not separately. For me, movement from social media, everything related to mobile devices, tablets, the explosion of cloud computing, where it's allowing some companies to access very, 
top technology at the same price and at the same scale as large corporations. And the explosion of information, that's what we call big data, those four driving factors are really change on how we do business at this point. And the world that we live in where they're not clear who are the consumers, who are the marketeers, we have a lot, lot, lot of lots of what we call data points to get our decisions, and we have to understand all the details about relationships between customers, among customers, and your clients, where how in this world you gauge your customers. You can create loyalty. You can really understand patterns of consumption. And to tell you the truth, what I'm seeing here is a lot of confusion. The CEOs, the presence of the companies, the leadership is completely lost with everything. So this confusion uh, is, uh, has penetrated through the organizations and from several layers of management. We've seen a lot of confusion for, uh, for what's happening with those four issues that I've talked about, the social mobile, uh, the data, and cloud computing. And for what I have seen and what I have been discussing with the leaders of this sector is it has become the new oil that's driving the economy growth. And I have just met Gwen Thomas, a wonderful lady. I've met her at the San Diego EDW conference a month ago. And I was talking to her, and she uh, told me this since that I, I decided to write because it was so powerful to me. And Gwen told, told me at the conversation that the balance of power in the 21st century, the balance of power, and when you talk about corporations, government, and institutions, is very influenced by on how it will be able to leverage the information assets that it has. Okay, so they if you use it quite well, you extract a lot of value from that. Just look at companies like Facebook, like Google. Those are the companies who really understood that, and they have been a success. And what this point is, the behaviors of what those companies do quite well with their data, you can uh, to corporate to regular and normal corporations, and that will help those companies to attract more business, to grow their margins, to attract new uh, set of customers. So for me, when I talk about data, I'm talking a lot about people. I'm talking about technology, process of dealing with everything. I'm talking about modeling and high-end analytics. Besides, I'm talking about communication which is a skill that's very, very important for people who are dealing with data. And on top of that, I'm talking decisions that will be made, and I'm talking of actions that will uh, happen when you look at this, this data. And what we have seen today, uh, companies who really understand that, they are creating what I call a data-driven culture. It is data-driven culture it's to be a disruptive factor in several industries. Because at the same time that uh, uh, all the possibilities are in the market, so we, we, uh, new competitors are changing the status quo, creating new companies that might take uh, an old business uh, out of the market. So data is very important and see that as a disruptive factor for that. For me, what is big data? Big data when, you, when you deal with a lot of information, we call a high volume of information, and you have to deal in a very fast way that you have to deal with velocity, and the data that, that you have, it comes from lots of lots of data sources, and from a variety of data sources, and the, 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 the data is very, uh, uh, in a sense that it, it has a, a lot of uh, details on that. So that's what they call big data. And the big data per se does not add value. What adds value is when you start applying analytics, when you start using 
using that data to help me with something, with our business goals, okay? So big data per se, it's a buzzword. I definitely agree with one. Probably this buzzword will fade away uh, in the years to come. However, the impact that the big data process and culture has uh, brought to us as a society has changed us forever. And why is that? Why uh, the term data exploded in the last years? Simple, because we are able to store information to all with zero cost than what happened in the past. So every digital information that is being created and generated at this point, then you throw that away. We start very, very easily. However, when I joined, uh, uh, when I started using email in some corporations in, in the uh, early 90s, you can could store more than like, uh, uh, I don't know, the 200 messages or I don't remember the, how many case for, uh, on your uh, um, uh, mail storage. And nowadays, I mean, if you go to accounts like uh, uh, Hotmail or Gmail, I mean, you can store as much information as you can. There are like almost no limits for that. So it becomes cheaper for that. And because of that, the information, store information is very, very cheap. We have seen this expo exponential growth of, uh, um, of data and data being stored. Okay, so the main difference between a traditional AI uh, uh, project from a big data project. So let's test what we call analytics. The term analytics, uh, uh, it existed for a long, long time. However, two years ago, Thomas Davenport, he wrote a very interesting book named Compete Analytics. And with that book, it was uh, suddenly in uh, um, race and awareness of this term analytics. Because of that time, the computing power was starting to get uh, uh, more. You could get more or less. You could use more data. And then this book came right in hand. And, and Prof Professor Thomas Davenport, on his book, wrote that it's a matter of using data, quantitative analysis, and predictive models they will have you drive uh, big and better decisions, okay? And when you use, when you uh, do big data projects, there are some degrees of maturity that you can achieve as time goes by. In the early uh, beginning, when you start doing your analytics projects, you're trying to, to do static, static reports, and all of a sudden, you give power to your users to do drill down on the reports, you allow the users to do some ad hoc uh, queries that, and by doing that and applying some cost of probability, you start to doing some forecast with high precision. And by that, with you refining your algorithms, accessing more data, you go to the next step, which, which I call predict modeling. And the, the most mature uh, for this curve, it happens when you have big optimization for you. And the more mature you have in your uh, use of analytics, the best you're able to compete. Like Accenture, Boeing, and uh, McKinsey, they need to follow up companies with financial performance compared to how they use analytics uh, for their business decisions. In fact, for the, uh, really quantitative research that they have done. They found out that cost, the companies who are more much analytics, they have better profits, they have better stock performance, they tend to have lower turnover among the employees, and they tend to be uh, seen as companies who are always on the best companies to work. Okay, so that's a matter of putting business on a competitive uh, uh, sphere. So analytics, it, for me, is not just about uh, analyzing large volumes, great scope of information, when you have real time and you're 
you, you use several data sources and things like that. It's everything. And it's a way that is transforming the process. It's the culture. I have said that it's bringing a new edge of competitivity to industries around the world. If you, Mario, can you define the big data? I'll define it two words, in behavior. Because as we are talking here, all this information, all this data that has been created, is being created by, because we're able, at the first moment of the young kind, to analyze everything that happened with the, uh, the people. It, uh, patterns of uh, product uh, consumption, patterns of what they post on Facebook, on how they consume information, patterns on how they interact among each other. Okay? And, uh, the value of big data, you can see that in several, several industries, from government to financial institutions to construction and everything. In every industry that you can go, you will always find uh, ways that you can make money on, on, on big data. Here in the United States, there has been a strong push from the Obama administration regarding the open data for the government to uh, open the data they have. A lot of uh, data companies and data providers and data exchanges are being questioned by the uh, regulatory agencies. The data that they have on how to provide uh, uh, transparency to citizens. Okay, so they take one factor. Retail, for example, retail. From the information that a, a supermarket chain is able to get from their PDVs, from their point of sales, when they compare that information with the patterns that, that, that are happening on the website, they can create a new way to compare and to generate money on top of that. So great. So we, we went to the first part about the current situation that we live at this point. Beautiful. So the complication. Why we're struggling to hire, to, to hire, to find and, and to hire uh, big data professionals. That's called the land of confusion. In the companies, there has been a lot of confusion of data responsibilities, of analytics responsibilities, of who should be doing what, when, and how. And that I'll raise to everyone. Who are data inside the organization? And that was a sentence that was given to me uh, one, one of the MIT uh, information quality uh, conference that that happened last year, I was there and that question uh, was raised. And this person here, Tom, Thomas Kelly, he uh, he works for the U.S. Army. In in his opinion, inside the Army, the person who is responsible, who owns the data, is the secretary of the Army. It is not a lieutenant there who is the person responsible for IT. It's not a general, four-star general. It's not a, a, a colonel uh, on the battlefield. At the end of the day, it's the, the highest rank in the organization. In case of the army, it's the secretary of the army. Everyone else that I've told you, the colonel, lieutenant, and the, the, the four-star general, they are caretaker of the data, and they are you of the data or maintainer of the data. So if you uh, put the inside a business, uh, a corporation, who owns the data? For me, the CEO. He's the, at the end of the day, the sole responsible for the data inside the organization. It's not the, uh, the CIO and the IT organization. They are not the owners of the data. Some marketing um, uh, manager or director who they contain in his always was there, he, he, she is not the owner of the data. It's not the, the, the CFO who has all the information a, a, about the, the financial performance of the corporation. They are not uh, the, the owners of the, the, the data that, that uh, was created and generated. And data inside organizations, they are fragmented, stored in several ways, from pen drives to disk drives, 
to the high end service that you have, to the cloud providers that you're hiring. It, when you have like information fragmented and, and, and scattered uh, uh, throughout the corporation, you will find silos of information. Silos where you, you, you have one person that thinks, okay, you, this information is in my notebook, so this information is mine. So I have put the information on that server so that I'm uh, responsible for and, and I'm owner of that information. You're not. You're not. They, the asset that should be seen as a corporate and enterprise asset. And when you start having fragmented information for the, the, the companies, what you see versus of the data in most current version, who has the most reliable data? And to streamline that, you have to out a concept called data life cycle was created. But data cycle is a very complex process to do. And above all, I have seen a lot of corporations that the data projects are being managed by IT professionals. And I think that's a terrible mistake because data projects are business projects. Like in the past, ERP projects, supply projects, they were uh, the, more, the successful ones were the ones that you had a business user responsible for the project. For data projects, for me, they are not responsibility of IT. IT should be part of that, but not the the the, the sole uh, responsible. And of everything, data is a very very abstract concept. So in in, this, in, in, the, in this webinar, if you are from from T, have studied computer science in, in college, and if I talk about data, you understand quite well what I'm talking about. Probably for, for from from HR person or for a market perspective, when I talk about data, data is a very abstract concept. So it's very hard for human beings to understand those abstract concepts. As I told you, the, the complexity of dealing with the life cycle it's hard because the main process is like you capture the data, you analyze the data, you make a deployment, and then you have to maintain that. Okay, those are just four phases, but on top of that, a lot of requirements, a lot of ghost rules, a lot of issues related to privacy, they come in. So it's not a very uh, uh, small issue to, to manage inside the organization. And look about those technology players, the technology players that uh, all of a sudden they, uh, every technology company in the world, they are a big data provider. Okay, so you, you have every traditional guy, so they decide, okay, let, I, I'm not uh, now a big uh, data provider. So I comment on this slide here uh, after you see the presentation. Print a couple of that and have. In, in, in your uh, brief case, anytime you go to a meeting where you like discussing a big data project or discussing who you should hire, take a look at this slide here. The slide shows the evolution that had since computers appear in the world and until today. So if you go to the bottom center part where I see punch cards, in the beginning information was stored on paper punch cards. And as time uh, went by from the, the 60s, we start to see like four files, uh, uh, files that were stored inside disks, sometimes there are no disks. And then it came up the concepts of tables, relations, SQL Server, which was a concept that appeared uh, on, on the low uh, 80s. And then we will see here a lot of branches on these three here of all technology that uh, we deal with data as of today. Folks, you're going to see a lot, something called Hadoop, MapReduce. Those are techniques that just appeared like for, for the last five years. And there's a lot of confusion here when we talk about big data. People say we're going to do a Hadoop and MapReduce project using the, these technologies. It's very, very wrong. So that's I'm suggesting you to, to make a copy of this slide and have with you. You can do big data projects with several and several technologies. However, when you do it Hadoop and MapReduce, you are doing in, in a new way that was uh, generated that allows you to do uh, with a cluster of uh, servers on, on, on the cloud. 
but that's not the only way. You can do uh, big data projects using several technologies. And right here, I'll show you some of the most important big data technology vendors that exist in the market uh, today. Probably have forgot someone, but there are some companies that are, are, are not here that should be inserted here. And when I look at this slide here, see that in the next few years, we will be having a lot of market consolidation. A lot of companies that are here, they will not be able to survive. They will not be able to generate money to sustain their business. A lot of companies here, they will merge uh, with, uh, with other business. A lot of companies here, they will be bought out by the large players. Just a, 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 a handful of those companies here that they were startups and they will be able to cross chasm on, on the future to come. So here I have a lots of lost technologies related to the big data uh, 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 initiatives. So when someone comes to you and say, "Okay, I'm going to do a big data project. Uh, hire me a Hadoop expert." Okay, you say, "Why Hadoop? Why not uh, uh, analyzing?" other options. And unfortunately, the technology vendors do not make things easier for us as customers. They care and they try to throw technology to us. Okay, hey, you buy all my technology, you're going to be uh, for, uh, forever. But I forgot to tell you that if you want to achieve different results, it's just not a matter of acquiring new technology. You can change the mentality of using this new technology. You've got to change the process on, on, on how you to do that. And if you want to have the same people on your business to use a new technology, you've got to train the, the, those people here to accept. So in, in a data analysis organization, for it to succeed, it has to look differently on the current in, uh, uh, process of the organization. And why Say the data, the big data uh, professionals that are being hired should be seen for each and one of you as a of change inside your business. The problem is the companies, companies, consulting companies, technology companies really, really understand at this point the details about doing data analytics projects. Because it requires you from moving from a technical management view to a strategic information management view. You have seen everything that will combine your business strategy, your processes strategy, your people strategy, your marketing strategy, everything. And data and technology and the process will need to support that. It, it's really, really, really hard. And that's why. It's very hard for HR professionals to find those skills. And trust me, it feels like you're going to see how hard it is. So the solution to do that. Okay. First thing, data, do you remember that I told you it's a very uh, abstract concept? My question is to find a real object that people relate to. If I talk about data, 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 and data management, data process, it's very hard to understand. But I show this picture here. Oh, okay. Let's imagine that we are a factory. Probably just a few of us in the webinar has put his or her feet in a factory. Being on the movies, you understand the factories. There are some where trucks come, they unload. Uh, 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 some components, and there are people, robots, a lot of things that have a factory that don't get materials that have been dropped off. And they are uh, worked in a sense that at the end of the day, you have products that came out of those materials that were first entered in a, in a factory, correct? correct? So on, on, on that sense, if you get to see 
data has been managed as a real object that people can understand and relate to, it's going to be much easier to identify that a systemic process for, for your business. And when I talk about data, you got to understand what's the data value chain inside your organization. Where are the data sources that I'm getting my information? And the data sources can be internal or can be from your partners, from your cloud, from your consumers, from your partners. Data that I acquire, in a some sense, this is collected. It's a, a lot of quality uh, process. Go at data. It's being sampling. You, you do a lot of statistics on that. You aggregate this data in a sense that you put this data, you combine it with other data. And then at the end of the day, you have end products that are the final result of data that you're working on. And that's the only way that you can make sense on, on, on top of that. And on my personal experience, my expertise with supply chain has helped me a lot to do my work on, on, on big data. Okay? Because it allowed me to have systemic and complete view of the chain on what that happens inside the organization. And I talk about system and quality and things like that. First person that comes to my mind is uh, Professor Deming. Professor Deming was uh, very famous uh, on the uh, late 40s, early 50s in Japan. He was an American professor, not very well now. He was doing his work. But when uh, his ideas that he wrote on, on 19, uh, from 1935 to 1940 was that you have to see Every factory, every production as an overall system where you've seen suppliers, you've seen receipts, you've seen production, you've seen tests, you apply quality in every part of this phase here and you distribute that to your market and you apply concepts design and redesign on every stage of those processes here. Okay. And for them, it became very popular when the Japanese uh, government hired him to have him another to help him to rebuild the Japanese industry that was completely destroyed uh, after the Second World War. So a concept like that to data management definitely help a lot for you to have be better quality within your data. And data can destroy credibility for any business. This year, the Federal Trade Commission, they found that one in every four American consumers had an information error in their credit report. And if you live here in the United States, you know that you cannot do anything. Get a car, get a mobile uh, line, get a uh, TV, uh, um, TV subscription to your home if you do not have a good credit score, right? So can you data air credit reports on companies like uh, Equifax, uh, Experian, TransUnion, and that's terrible. So in scene, we're coming to a point where uh, if you don't do the information properly, that can hurt your business at the end of the day. So a lot of people who work with data, you will, you will hire those people to ask them about quality programs, what they understand about quality, how do they see quality as part of their business. And there are several, several quality programs throughout the world. And some of them were created for data, like the data uh, uh, DMBOC framework that I show here in the center. Some of them, like what, what you see here on the left side, is called PDCA. That was created by Professor Dan in, in the 30s. For, factory, for, for, uh, for, uh, for performance for, from factories and manufacturing. And they're be using for data management and data quality purpose at this, at this point. So, for that. so you're trying to create a big data team. You're trying to hire big data professionals for your business. 
say that you can do big data if you do not have a data strategy in place, if you do not have the policies, data governance, a security program in place as well, you don't have a data architecture, and if you do not have a data team that's focused on analytics and a data team that's focused on quality, if you not if you not have all those foundations as part of your team responsibility, what the results will be not as good as you think they are. They're very very uh, 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 it's going to hurt you at the end of the day. So if you do big data projects quite well. Bear in mind that you have to put all those functions on, on, on your ground of your organization. And guess what happened? Start twice. They need to hire data leaders that will think strategically about the data, that will follow all the lines regarding on this foundation here to manage the data organization. And data, at the end of the day, it just a raw material. The data is when you can get raw material and make it very useful for business users. And that's why I, uh, uh, my point is, this is not a technology issue. This is much more an issue related to business. And to read everything from these organizations, new titles arrive in the market. Chief Sir, Head of Analytics, Data Scientist. And let me explain my point of view on those titles here. First, if you think about those foundations there, those nine or 10 foundations that I have put, you need definitely someone who has a broader view, who can look at all the people and processes and technology that you're doing that, then will be responsible for managing that. So for, for me, you will need someone who can lead that organization in a sense that will drive business results. Because what? Do you remember in the beginning that I told you that who is the owner of information? And a lot of people from IT think they own the data inside the organization. Schools that at this point, they are the senior leader of technology in a company. They're very concerned with this new role that's coming up in the market. Why? Because the new roles for the chief data officer, chief analytics officer, they are questioning how IT is doing their current job in their organizations. Okay? So it's like the new kid on the block suddenly arriving on, on the corporation and say, hey, you guys are doing something wrong. Let's do it the right way. Let's see. Let's look at data C as an asset. Let's treat as economic asset. Let's look here on, on, on how to make money and why they, uh, that, that has brought some, some concerns. So you see, data scientist is a person or a team who will be looking at the data to look for insights. And after those insights happen, you make it operational. You have to make the information available throughout the organization. And after those insights are shared uh, throughout the organization using specific technology, then you have your data cycle complete. Get it is a lot of steps. Uh, that I'm showing here. There's a way that you can make it happen if you do not have a business leader responsible for that. So the main difference between a chief data officer and a data scientist is that a chief data officer will only all the steps throughout the process. And a data scientist will have a more technical role looking at the, the, the data by itself Look in the context of the business. The chief officer, the lead data scientist, or the chief analytics officer is the executive responsible to manage the data professionals inside the organization. And why IT you make this transition? Because, as I told you, it's not a technology project. The data teams are big bridge between IT and the business units. In a sense, that the role of the chief officer and the role of the data organization 
uh, the, 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 this thing here should be responsible to make the bridge between business and IT, should be thinking about the data governance, should be thinking about the systems and the processing in, in, in involved in a way that you are applying supply chain management concepts to achieve the goals of the organization. And uh, 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 bad IT, that's not that, they, ha they have their value. But matter that when you think of a business in a true architecture model, when you think business, any company to have a business architecture that they to 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 market, I will go after what kind of products and services I will have, what kind of customers I'm looking for. That's business architecture, and they look at the technology architecture. Say we're going to have that many servers, we are going to deploy cloud computing. We're going to give uh, those options here for users. To, to access our information. We're going to buy uh, iPads for people in the field. That's the technology architecture. The data architecture is the bridge that will help the business architecture and the technology architecture to work well. And that's why you need three different mindsets to make it, 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 it work in an organization. Professor Peter Eichen, uh, he just wrote a book. Uh, that you need a, 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 a chief data officer sooner or later because you are facing with tsunamis of massive data that are happening nowadays. And if you don't have an executive that's responsible for all engineering aspects, architecture, and deliver organizational data success, we will not be able to use your data to make money. And data science, at the end of the day, is this process of taking the raw data, produce information, make this information useful, make this information a way that will drive actions, and at the end of the day, we will bring money to our organization. And when you look at the value chain of data inside the organization, here on very technical components like the big data, big data appliances, data warehouses, and you look like information management concepts like data governance, data integration, data quality, visualization, and you look very complex analytic stuff, analytic, analytic process like description analytics, predictive analytics, machine learning reporting. See, those are very complex issues that will serve vertical companies, uh, retailers, uh, people from finance. So the data the organization, they are res uh, responsible to manage overall. And the chief data officer is that ex that's going to be responsible for managing the core aspects of the data, the data governance programs, and all the analytics involved on that. That's where the, 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 the chief officer co comes in handy. And one thing that's uh, very important today is like, like what makes a great chief data officer a person who will to this organization to bring money at the end of the day. That's not, not responsibility for the chief data officer to keep writing code or writing SQL server scripts. And, and if you do that, like you're wasting a tremendous effort from a senior leader put in a role that he or she should not be responsible. Gartner wrote a great article on this last year at chief executive officers, CDOs, they are not a Fed because, as I told you, the big data uh, tsunami that we we're just passing through, that's, that is a uh, consequence uh, for our uh, lives forever. So you want to create a data, big data organization? Great. It's for things. You process to implement that. You need methodology to deliver your services because at the end of the day, a data organization is a, is a service organization that will support the business. You need good technology to support your needs. And above all, you need people. If you don't have any of those four components, forget it. You are doing a poorly job in implementing a data organization. And a few examples of some screw-ups that I have uh, personally passed through recently. And some of the of those screw ups that I have seen uh, that uh, some of my colleagues had told me uh, in private. Before I start, 
something. Those cases are real. Uh, also, I changed a lot of things here, a lot of texts, so not to find uh, uh, who they were. So I'm trying to protect the sense and also the, the guilt one. The guilt one. Let me show some, some good uh, examples of why we're not doing that uh, 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 good. Let's talk about a, 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 an advertising agency, very large group, very large media group. And they were searching for a head uh, of analytics. And guess what? They were aligned, but they interviewed those people, but no, they, did not, they could not move the process forward because HR need five candidates to move the process to the next phase. Any time they had five candidates, guess what? One of the candidates gave up, found another job, they decided not, not, not to compete anymore. This position has been open for more than eight months. And so they did not hire anyone. So the point is, is it is really hard to have someone hired at, at, at this point? I mean, it's been eight months and, and this business has been operated. So uh, my, my recommendation to this company here is that you forget about it. You have survived for eight months without a person, and you cannot uh, 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 apply this, this rule of having five candidates. So that, that, that's not good. Okay, let me tell about this, this service company. The service company, uh, they have a headquarters in the Bible Belt. They were looking for a vice president responsible for data, BI, data warehouse. It was, a very, uh, it was a leadership role, and I had a friend of mine who applied for the position. Everything was going so well when he was talking, talking to the recruiters, the, 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 the senior management of the company, and then she started to talk to the upper management there. And the conversation went kind of like, like uh, um, you know, we like that much. My, she, she was like what, uh, a true minority person, being Hispanic from Latin America, and she, she So together, me and my friend, we went to LinkedIn, to Facebook, and we completely mapped Every executive of the company, who reports to whom, uh, where they went to school, their rents, and what found? We found that at first level, the CEO on the level of the vice president, and on the level uh, below on the senior vice president, you could find anyone that I made that did live on the Bible Belt and didn't go to a certain uh, range of schools, okay? So I told a friend, hey, look, it, 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 it's just not a matter of knowing, uh, not knowing your skills, what they need. It's a matter of culture. They with you because probably you don't fit the culture what they're looking for. The healthcare services company, this was uh, really interesting. Looking for a data director or a, and chief of analytics, the same position. And part of the description was, at our company, we worship God's love for people. If you have this, this position, we will be able to work and support your mission statement, respect the diversity of employees, and work in a way that aligns with core values. And my point is, okay, how about if the candidate is an atheist? We'll see the so that's one of the issues that, that I think that uh, we, we, we're uh, not, not looking, looking for the overall picture. And that's, that one here, it happened to me. Uh, May technology vendor, very recognized, but they didn't have a clue on big data. They were searching for a, a senior sales and business leader for their consulting practice. I had a very detailed interview process. In, in one of the interviews, uh, one of the people who interviewed, he, he asked me, oh, Hey, can you talk about your Hadoop map reduce programming skills? So, I understand. You want a business leader writing code? So I can to to the recruiter, to the hiring man, say, oh, maybe we're, we're missing something here. You're asked for a sales business strategy leader, and 
why does, does the, that person need to program? So the point is, change the job title. Avoid questions like that because you're doing a completely waste of time of each one of the people you're interviewing. That's never going, going, going to work. You're frustrating everybody. And this is uh, the, the last experience that I want to share. Consumer insurance company, they were searching for a vice president of data analytics to report to the marketing uh, uh, executive vice president. And the, on, the, on the job description of the senior data analytics person, he, they put there, creativity is a key for our success. Dude, you're doing your own slides. In the case of executive maturity, the more you partner, the more successful your team will be. Creativity, we're not just looking for another uh, new letter example. You have to open your minds throughout analytics. And you, have, you, you, you don't have the data analytics college from education, but you have a kick butt field experience with the two. Kick butt? Well, I know I can kick some butts, but uh, uh, what I've seen here from the description here, they, they, they took a marketing role and combined with data and, and put the, the, this advertising. No, not very good. So, what the future brings us, I see that the companies that will thrive in 2015 were the ones who will adapt faster to this scenario, are the companies who will be able to use analytics quite well, and are the companies who will be able to use great human capital for their purpose. And if you're looking at your big data projects, think big data is there to make money for your business, to reduce your current costs, or also to improve your efficiency. And what it take if a company wants to succeed in this data journey? Motivation. You have to hire the best and most eager resources you find in the market. If you're the best, but they're willing to take one for the team, if they're eager to take one for the team, but not good in what they do, you have them as well. So you, you, it's a matter of finding the best, Technical costs, qualitative costs, and also combined with call, you have to, you must have blood in your ears to do this job at this point. A friend named Shami uh, Akmena, he wrote a paper with, with a checklist to hire big data professionals. And Shami has a very great point. He said, where they are, you have to think global, but they're not just around the corner. Probably they, they live uh, on the east. Coast, probably they, they, uh, they, they live on, on the west coast, probably they live somewhere in a city in the middle of the country. You have to understand that there is not just a matter of money. Those data professionals, they're trying to look to create something. Also, they must understand and think them what they to do. They have to have a clarity of your business strategy overall. No, you will not be able to bring them unless you have available for tools, for data acquisition, and for all the resources that you're going to need. It's not a matter of trying to bring one person that you're going to see the results. You have to think bigger than that. If you should download his paper, I, I really recommend. Uh, Shami uh, has done a, a great and super job on, on putting it very clear for recruiters. So a data team must have passion for analytics. Always be want to learn. It's not of receiving hard questions. And of all, they should be the bridge between IT and the business to succeed. Let's talk about salaries. Salaries from positions like that, as of today, they range from 300K a year for chief officer, chief analytics officer, or VP roles up to $2 million a year if you consider some financial companies uh, in New York City, okay? Very spread out, uh, and uh, I, I, I would say if you think this uh, expensive when you try to bring something, bring a much sure to do your business strategy. I'm sure that you're going to be paying a much, much higher price than that. And include about big data if you want to hire well. well projects happening, they are changing how companies compete in the market. The projects are, at the end of the day, business projects. Talent is scarce, 
And Kinsey predicts that we do, not it's alone, we're going to have a lack of almost 200,000 analytics people in, in, in the next three years. And a new breed of professionals is in need. Professionals who understand data, who understand technology, who are good at com communicating with people, who are great at making the right connections to deliver results. And hard managers and HR professionals, they have to work together on that. Finding these people attracting a thing uh, above all, because the worst thing that can happen is that you bring a, a data organization in place and they become frustrated because you have not planned for their career development, for the budget that's going to be needed to buy a, a new things that's necessary for them to do their work. Okay, so that's what I had to say. Those are, are more information. And uh, uh, Shannon, pass the to you. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we're right at the top of the hour, but um, I do encourage the audience to submit their questions in the Q&A section there in the bottom right-hand side, uh, as Mario has offered to write up the answers to your questions, and we'll get that in the follow-up email that will go out with the links to the slides and links to the recording within the next two business days, so by end of day Monday. Um, Mario, we, just, we do have one quick question that came in, if you don't mind just hanging out just a little bit here. Um, Question is, good research requires quality data. So who would be responsible for data quality? Is it the CDO or a, is it CDO who's responsible for that? A question, Robin. Yes, the chief data officer, main goal is to bring money. And you not bring money if you do not have a data architecture in place and if your data does not have quality. Remember when I presented this slide, about the foundations of the data team. One of the foundations there is data quality. So overall, the chief data officer is the sole responsible for the data quality inside the organization. Great question. That's really all we have time for. Mario, thank you so much for another great presentation. This was just really another just very fantastic, very educational. Uh, thanks to everyone for attending today and for your time. We look forward to it. And again, I will send out the links to the slides and links to the recording within two business days. And Mario, I'll be sure to send out your um, contact information there so in case you have any additional questions. I look forward to it. Thank you. Bye.